Good evening and welcome to Radio. This is Ken Grady, co-host of Gospel Music Today, and we're honored to be part of the Gospel Music Programming brought to you by House C Productions Gospel. Check out Gospel Music Today for the latest news, guests, concert updates, and exclusive live gospel concerts from the world of Southern Gospel. Housey Productions Gospel and Gospel Music Today, bringing families, communities, and churches together. Radio, coming from 231 down south here in the big city of Beatrice, Alabama. We are going to be doing some country and western. I'll see Radio Gospel Music today. Ken and Jean Grady, 2020. All right. Uh, get to know Ken and Jean Grady. We're going to open up with an interview um, from uh, Gospel Music Report. <clears throat> it runs about 40 minutes or so this week on Gospel Music Today. Also, we're going to be uh, <clears throat> doing Doug Krigman and Zach Barman, the Down East Boys, uh, the guests of Gospel News Today for week June 28th. Ken and Jane Gray, the host Southern Gospel News, concerts, updates. The feature gospel groups is uh, Battle Cry. Gene reviews their new record by Tim McKenzie, an article from Christian Voice Magazine is the subject of this week's news notes. The show features a uh, new music video from the Neelands, exclusive concert video of the Raggles, recorded by Gospel Music. Today, cameras is in Duncan, South Carolina, and visit to Gospel Music Today archives for an exclusive video of Rayborn, Reborn, recorded by Gospel Music Today cameras in Broken Era, Oklahoma. You can also check out the links to Gospel Music concerts and events as well. We're going to be getting that on that set for you too, but let's get to the music and the interview of Ken and getting to know Ken and Gene Grady. Again, welcome. It's uh, 9 o'clock here in the big city of Beatrice, Alabama, and um, we hope you are staying safe, you are wearing your mask, you're being smart about what you're doing, and let's enjoy some good information by Ken and Dean Grady. Again, welcome to House of Red Gospel, Flaws on Radio. Enjoy the broadcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Gospel Music Report. Now, if you've not already noticed, this episode is a little different from the first, and that's because it's the introduction to an additional format I'm going to be implementing into the episode rotation. Um, I've always intended to interview people, and as I can get to them, I'll be sprinkling them in here and there as schedules allow. These won't be written commentary pieces, but rather just simple discussions between myself and whoever I get to sit down with. Now, I've done my best to make it somewhat visually stimulating, but this was an over-the-phone interview, as I'm assuming most of them will be. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoy it. But before we jump in, I wanted to say thank you to all of you who liked, commented, and shared Episode 1 with your friends. I greatly appreciate the response and the feedback. Also, thank you very much to those who have graciously decided to support me on Patreon over at patreon.com slash gospelmusicreport. You are the people who are going to keep this moving forward, and for that, I'm especially grateful. Ken and Gene Grady are the founders and hosts of the television show Gospel Music Today. Through the years, they've traveled and interviewed hundreds of artists while featuring just as many on their broadcast. And though today they're certainly no strangers to the gospel music world, this style of music was nowhere to be found in their background. In 1988, they were living separate lives in the town of Coventry, Rhode Island, where Ken was a school teacher and Jean was a director of music. I was the, um, I'd become the director of the Patuxent Valley Community Chorus, which was a local community chorus in the town that we lived. And uh, Ken was a school teacher. Our, our community chorus met at the school once a week, and he was a school teacher there. And also, he was an advisor for the radio station. At, at the high school, and, and so his kids provided the lights and sound for our shows. And it was oh. through that that I met him, and it just so happened that the president of the chorus said the first Christmas, he said, um, be sure you contact Ken Grady to do the lights and sound for your Christmas program. And I said, well, 
at that time, I said, what does he do? Because I, I didn't know. And he said, well, he's a, a, a single guy. He's a school teacher right here. And I said, oh, I said, you know somebody that's single? I said, I needed a date for the Christmas program <laughs> or to the Christmas party for work. And um, so this person became the matchmaker to try to get us together and he had to work quite hard to do that Uh, we would see one another on rehearsal nights and it was the course of about five years before we uh, got married but we just dated uh, during that five years and um, so that that's basically how we met and he continued working with the course he became the MC for our chorus programs and um, uh, still had the kids there that were doing the lights and sound for us. So that's, that's how we met. I personally assumed that Ken had always intended to be in broadcasting, but although he was familiar with radio, he actually went to college to become a school teacher. Later, I asked them both how they came to the decision to start their show, but at this time in Ken's life, it wouldn't be until nearly 20 years later when he and Gene would meet. However, someone else did have their eye on him. As soon as soon as I walked out of that college, the uh, the draft board had their eye on me. This was in the Vietnam era, so I had I started teaching, and then eight weeks later got drafted. So okay. uh, so my actual broadcasting started at that point. Because I knew that you had done. Uh, broadcasting in the when you were in the military, right? Um, and I, I guess I just assumed that you had you had trained for that purpose, but that's just something that sort of fell into your lap. Yeah, well, I had done college radio, and uh, and I had played in a band during college, so I was familiar with all the local disc jockeys in the Providence area, including the the disc jockeys at what was the the big station then, WPRO in Providence. So when I got drafted, uh, I got I went through basic training and I got sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and got trained as an artillery surveyor. That's the guy that sits up on top of the hill and directs which way the uh, guns are supposed to fire. Hmm. So um, they they held me at the school after the school was done, because I, I, I did very well in the school, they held me there and made me an instructor in the school for officers. So when I, uh, when I eventually got orders to go to Korea, by that time I, my pals there in the Army were uh, captains and majors, and I, I said, what do I need to do? I don't want to go to Korea and sit on the 39th parallel directing guns in case there's a, a second Korean war breaks out. So they told me what to do. I got the guys at uh, WPRO to write letters of recommendation saying what a great broadcaster I was. They had no clue. Uh, <laughs> and when I got to uh, Korea, they 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 drop you in, the, in a big warehouse when they, when they send you to a country and then distribute everybody out to where they're going to go. Well, I was still sitting there at the end of the week, so I went to the office and told the, uh, the clerk in the office, who was even dumber than I was, uh, I said, I think there's been a mistake. I'm still stuck here, and I think the problem is I was supposed to go to uh, the American Forces Radio and Television, and I think maybe somebody lost my uh, paperwork. So the kid picks up the phone and calls the American Forces Radio and Television Headquarters mm-hmm. in Seoul. There's a civilian in charge of it, and um, he has the paperwork that I sent him sitting on his desk when the clerk calls him. So the clerk explains what's going on. The civilian knows that the clerk is <laughs> just some <laughs> poor guy that got conned into this, but he says, that sounds right. Send him over here. Hmm. So I spent my two years in the military to, uh, reading the news on television and playing records on the radio. And uh, that was the, the beginning of uh, what we do now. You know? That's how broadcasting really started for you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's my understanding that neither of you grew up listening to this 
style of music. I mean, would it, especially you can. I mean, you're, Gene, your your father was a Baptist preacher. Yes, he was a Southern Baptist preacher, um, but we really didn't have uh, Southern gospel music. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. we, some gospel songs, uh, some hymns. But back when I was growing up, the Southern gospel music as we know it today would have been more in the uh, Pentecostal churches, not so much in the okay. Baptist churches. And so in, in some cases, it, it was foreign, a little foreign to me, but um, and, and definitely not for Ken. And, mm-hmm. and the way that we uh, were kind of introduced to it is that we had a, a musical theater in in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, that Ken and I used to like to go to, and we happened to uh, get tickets to a Statler Brothers concert. And we went to see the Statler Brothers, and at the end of their concert, they did the gospel songs. And Mm -hmm. uh, we just, we fell in love with them, and it was just shortly after that that Bill Gaither was doing um, um, a homecoming series up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and uh, we... You can hear that Ken's phone going off. So we went up yeah. there and um, and 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 just kind of got immersed in, in in the music. We liked it, and I was a, a choir director at a church, so I started ordering choral music that really was uh, Southern gospel music, uh, some of Mike Speck's cantatas and things like that. And the choir just ate it up; they loved it, and so that that started. What, what we were doing with Southern Gospel. And then Ken continued it on with promotions. So <clears throat> when you guys met and Ken was a teacher, um, what was the transition from where he decided that he wants to get back into his broadcasting and doing it with Southern Gospel music? Well, <clears throat> when you guys met and Ken was a teacher, um what was the transition from where he decided that he wants to get back into his broadcasting and doing it with Southern gospel music? Well, that really, that really happened after when I retired, um, okay. I got back into television. One of the, one of the uh, kids that had been on the radio station at the high school, a lot of them went on to work in uh, radio and television and um, I had been retired just a little while, and I got a phone call from a former student who was now working at Channel 6 in Providence and wanted to know if I wanted to come and work there part-time. So I did. So I got back into it you know, that way. We started the uh, television show in Rhode Island of our own. Rhode Island had a, uh, all the, in, in, in those days, there were several local cable companies in Rhode Island instead of like it is today where it's mainly a few big uh, big companies. There were all these, each town had its own little cable company and um, they were all hooked together by uh, microwave and they had a channel that was devoted to religious broadcasting and if you produced a show, they would put it on there for free and it would run statewide. So we got back into it that way and used that show to promote the groups that we were uh, having to come up to sing mm-hmm. at the church, and that's how we got we got back into that. So this the show that we do now is technically not a full time job, although <laughs> you know it's it's a lot of hours. But uh, well, I, I mean, as you two have known since you're here talking to me, you you know that I've started my own show and this is just the second episode um so i can understand that there there be some difficulties things that come up um for example i record this out of my bedroom i'm sitting in my bedroom right now and i understand you you two are in your studio yeah um and uh i mean for me personally my studio i just went to lowe's and bought some wallboard and and screwed it into my drywall and i use on my laptop and my iphone uh Mm -hmm. For the rec- I've even rigged up my own homemade teleprompter using my phone and my Apple TV, and it's it's a long story. But so my biggest issue right now is just time and money. But you two have been doing this for uh, how long has the show been going? 
I think I've said 15 years for the past three years, but, <laughs> but more than 15 years. Let's just put it there. 